It's great to see all of you again. I saw a lot of you last night. Didn't get a chance to shake as many hands as I might have liked. I hope you all had a nice dinner. Uh, I got a pause when I got home. My wife expected me to be after dinner. And they were having a little uh, problem with my continuing to be, continuing to be busy at my age. And make matters worse to tell you about my schedule today. Uh, and it's, I just can't kind of help the full disclosure. Um, I am uh, going to be with you all day until I just finished about a half an hour interview with Christine Benz from Morningstar. And I'll be with you all day till around 2 o'clock, 2 30, and I'll be back in the office till 3 30. And then, for reasons best known to the Lord, I guess. Uh, I'm getting driven to New York uh, to go to a biannual, biennial meeting of the Printco Instant Investment Management Company, a board of trustees, and every other year they invite the former trustees back of the investment company for Princeton's endowment. And I've been involved in it for a long time. I'm, I haven't been a director, I don't think, for maybe eight or ten years. But I can't kind of resist the temptation and to go back once more and see how we're doing, see who's on the board. There's some very, very smart people. Um, actually, they went to Princeton, for heaven's sake. <laughs> and uh, it's kind of nice, and it's, it conflicts a little bit with my priority to be with you, and my priority to be with um, over at Vanguard tonight. Uh, but I, I do want to say, so I regret that I, that I can't be there. There's no, no, no political implications at all. And then about, Nine o'clock and so tonight, I'm coming back to Philadelphia in the car. And yeah, and I know everybody's saying the man is nuts. And where's my wife? And, uh, but she said I could do it, sort of. And, uh, so uh, it's, it's kind of a busy day, and I'll be with you again tomorrow morning to hear Gus in particular, but to hear anybody else, and hear all of you. And I'll hear some of you this afternoon, but I'd like to hear the input from you all. And then this may be. TMI, but uh, I have to leave here tomorrow at about 11.30 and I get a CAT scan on my ailing shoulder, which is not mending the way it's supposed to mend. And then I'm taking the afternoon off. <laughs> <laughs> Even the Lord rested on the sixth day. Or was it? <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad to be with you. And I just wanted to tell you that um, we've come a long way at Vanguard and uh, with engagement with the Bogomans. And I don't think it's any secret that the first time Kevin, Kevin and I were working on signs to welcome you to our campus about probably eight or nine years ago, we were told to take down the signs. 2001, told to take down the signs. No one would be allowed on the campus. And uh, we have our ways of dealing with that. <laughs> that uh, the, uh, the orders were rescinded and then, then the door got open, got a jar, and then what, the first the jar and then wide open in the last two or three years. Uh, we've really, I think, measured up in a very good way. And I want to give great credit to, to John Worth, our PR guy, and even more credit to Glenn Reed, a relatively new managing director, uh, with whom I'm quite close, and he just wants to make sure all this gets done just right for you all. Because everybody there now recognizes after some delay, what a huge, huge asset you are individually and as a group to Vanguard's name and reputation. I think John Worth said something about you're our biggest boosters and our fiercest critics, and uh, you need criticism. You need criticism. We need criticism. Uh, I may overdo it a little bit, but uh, <laughs> be that as it may. Um, it's going to be a nice evening for you all. I'm just sorry I can't join you tonight. But it's a busy day, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it all. Uh, I want to begin uh, in a way, a curious way. Uh, it sets the tone of what I'll be doing today. It has to be a tie-in for the man for whom I have enormous respect, and that would be Taylor Larimore. And I was Taylor here this morning. Yeah. So I have to tell a story in the first act of my spectacles. Um, at the end of my remarks this morning, if I have time, I'm going to tell you about a new book that's coming out, which uh, my wonderful assistant, 
Michael Nolan calls Mita, M-I-T-A. It's called Man in the Arena. And it's not written by me, it's written by a whole lot of people who did the Fort Legacy Forum at Wall Street a year ago, and has transcripts of that, a whole lot of other information in it. Uh, but, uh, and some of some my, my more recent speeches and that kind of thing. And some of it is the four still my books, such a distinguished uh, group, group of people. And uh, so, um, getting into that, we have letters from many shareholders, uh, from many, like, big shots, uh, Warren Buffett, et cetera, and uh, one had about 10 letters from the vocal heads. And one of those letters, this is in the book, is a fairly long letter from Taylor Larimore. And I'm going to quote you from that because I some of my remarks today. In 1999, this is quoting Taylor, I learned Mr. Bogle was going to be the keynote speaker in the money show. And my wife and I in Orlando, and my wife Pat and I made the decision to go hear the speech and hope to meet him personally. Um, he'd been on the cover of the Financial World, blah, blah, blah. And we expected John Bogle, chairman of the giant mutual fund company, to be surrounded by guards and staff, not two old ladies seeking advice. <laughs> Pat and I listened to the conversation. We followed Jack into the auditorium and the ladies into the auditorium. We immediately went to the podium to speak to a crowd of several thousand. This is a portion of his exact words as reported by the press. This is my words in speech to the money show. There are all these people selling him stuff. Um, so I began by saying I count you'll have the opportunity to attend roughly 130 different seminars masterminded by more than 100 speakers. It looks to me that the great preponderance of them will offer you their secrets for success in the new millennium. Many speakers will offer you tempting solutions involving a best complexity and a worst financial ledger domain of witchcraft. <laughs> I must confess, no offense intended to the presenters, he said, I wince when I see so many subjects that seem to offer easy roads for you to build your capital. Wealth creation and preservation, increasing yields, to 15 to 20 percent. The trillion dollar opportunity of the internet. Mention that. Finding future wealth in diamond mines. High profit, low risk strategies, etc. <coughs> I assume, I continued in my opening my remarks, from the titles these speakers will offer you the secrets of success. Let me offer mine. The one great secret of investment success is that there is no secret. Investment success, it turns out, lies in simplicity as basic as the virtues of thrift, independence of thought, financial discipline, realistic expectations, and common sense. Taylor then gets back to his words, I doubt Mr. Vogel will be invited back. <laughs> candor as a result of that failure to get a second invitation. Uh, by the way, the, the guy that, run the, that ran the money show is like, I'm, I'm standing here doing my speech, and he's sitting next to me, just like where Mel is sitting with me now. And I'm sensing. Uh, well, I don't know what I'm sensing. You can probably figure it out better than I can. <laughs> But uh, I didn't lose my candor. I haven't lost my candor. And, uh, so I'll be as tactful as I can today, but uh, it's, it's hard for me to say something, some words that other people put in my mouth, and it's hard for me to defend my own opinion. And I guess when you're 111 years old, that's a little hyperbole. Um, you ought to say what you think. And I've been doing that for more years than I care to count, and you'll hear more of it today. So thanks, Taylor, for that, and thanks for being here with us. You know, I said some things about you last night. You've been a very dear friend. You've gone through a terribly troubled time. We all have to go through one way or another in our lives. But uh, you've been a great ally, a great booster. And his friendship and loyalty and just his integrity and human being, this phrase I made up somewhere, um, speaks volumes. I think the spirit of all the vocal heads, he's, he's really the founder. So I want to thank Mike Nolan again for helping me with these slides.
we had, I decided we had too many slides last year and we have four more this year. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to go through them fairly quickly and uh, just cover what we can. And uh, so um, we'll just go on. Now, Mike and I have been very busy in the last couple of, in the last couple of weeks, really, uh, trying to get ready for this and do, you know, think about some new things and put it in some cogent way. We're trying to do, he's trying to do the final proofs of Man in the Arena, this, this book about me. And, uh, and it seems to be our responsibility rather than publishers. Publishers don't do a very good job on that. So he was in the office, I think, till 9 or 10 last night? Something like that. Uh, midnight. Midnight. <laughs> you okay this morning? I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Mike is Kevin's replacement. Kevin gave me 11 years of loyal service, and I, Kevin's, I think, going to stop by and see all of you. I don't know if any of them remember. And is Emily in the room now? She is. Where is Emily? Do we got a hand somewhere now? Oh. Take such good care of me. Has the patience of Job. Uh, <laughs> when I get excited or upset, which is very, very rare. <laughs> Where are my glasses, Emily? <laughs> um, she soldiers through it. She's been very loyal. She's been with me for 24 years now. Wow. She's been with Vanguard. She doesn't look old enough to do this, I'll say that. But she's been with Vanguard in maybe 27 or 28 years. I should know exactly. Uh, but in any event, we owe her, all of you, she's a big participant in helping you all get around and getting the things that need to be done here. So with Mike and Emily and Sarah, who's not quite involved in all this, that's my little team. And uh, we get a lot done, and I enjoy it. And uh, their patience and understanding is beyond any reasonable belief. So um, I want to thank them for starting to talk to you. And in the middle of trying to do these three or four things, which is pretty much a full-time job anyway, out comes, and I'm going to start with this kind of a slide in a minute, out comes, uh, out comes the Wall Street, the uh, newspaper yesterday. And it's about these new uh, Nobel laureates. And uh, the op-ed in the Wall Street Journal said something to the effect of, um, I owe a great debt of gratitude to Gene Palmer for coming up with the efficient markets theory. And uh, that is so far from the truth that I felt compelled to write a letter to the editor of the journal about it. <laughs> and the problem with it is two things. One, um, I'd never heard of Gene Palmer when I came up with the idea for the index fund, which is a significant difference from what this fellow argued. And number two, I don't even agree with him. Uh, He's a very strong-minded, and, and, and I, I can't say that I'm right and he's wrong, but what does one say about a hypothesis that is sometimes right and sometimes wrong? Sometimes markets are efficient, sometimes markets are inefficient, and we never really quite know when, but we do know from the work I've done, I'm going to show you a little of this this morning, um, that, that in the long run, they're highly efficient, and in the short run, this is stocks valued relative to bonds, what kind of efficiency? And in the short run, there can, can be years, even decades of inefficiency. So I don't subscribe to the theory. And that gave rise for me to tell the journal uh, that uh, the EMH meant nothing to me, efficient market hypothesis. So I had to come up with a nice resounding counter to that, which I call the CMH, the cost matters hypothesis. You've seen me write about it. <laughs> <laughs> and that hypothesis is universally true every minute, every day, every century, and that is everybody shares the market return. The ones that do best have the lowest cost. It's as simple as that. It is as simple as that, this simple theory of mine. And it doesn't have anything to do with Gene Fama. So I wrote a letter, which, by the way, Emily and Mike both told me not to send. <laughs> <laughs> and I did, I did modify it, right, Mike? You did, yes. <laughs> a little bit, and uh, so they're, they're, they, they liked it a lot. Uh, I talked to the head, who's writer, the editor, writer who I've had some correspondence with over the last couple of years, and uh, what's going to happen to it, I don't know, uh, but I'll, I'll probably uh, publish what I sent uh, somewhere along the way, but it's still up in the air, and I'm going to guess that they would have some shortened version 
of this uh, 500 word letter to the editor, 195 actually. Uh, and actually, there was one word that shouldn't have been in it. I loved it for long, so it's only 494. Uh, and uh, we'll see what happens. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Nobel One, which is Gene Palmer. What does that thing say? Oh, yeah. Um, oh, that's the interesting point. I told the journalist, if he likes indexing so much, and if he's the father of indexing or something somehow, uh, why did he start a non-index firm called the FA, the National Fund Advisors. You know, he, he believes there are sections of the market that are permanently undervalued, persistently undervalued, and uh, I don't have to believe that. And the FA has built a big business, a highly profitable business, on, um, on the very idea that, that there, you can find like Japanese small cap stocks, as one example, or value stocks, or small cap stocks generally. And sometimes he's right and sometimes he's wrong. Uh, he doesn't tell you too much about the latter. So that first one, let me get my copy of it here. So I'll keep looking around and looking away tonight. Um, well, and then, what do I want to do next? Um, we'll come to this in one second. Um, he says he doesn't, he doesn't believe there's such thing as bubbles. And uh, I'm going to show you that there are such thing as bubbles, and anybody <laughs> should be able to figure it out. So let's go to that next slide, Mike. Um, uh, Bob Schiller, who you probably know about, he has this way of looking at markets in 10 year or 15 year aggregate earnings. He's perfectly valuable. Sometimes he's right, sometimes he's wrong. Uh, but he is another Nobel laureate for the year. And uh, he disagrees uh, with Gene Bauman. And as he says, he thinks efficient markets is the most damaging investment hypothesis in history. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I, I did tell the journal in my letter, I thought I was a little over the top. <laughs> I mean, that was Charlie Ponzi. Yes. <laughs> I off. Um, so, uh, they, uh, they raise these issues, and, and it's the issue of who two guys win the Nobel Prize, and they disagree. Mm -hmm. so let me talk about, and Bert Malfield thinks I'm wrong on this, you should know that. But let's, let's see how I'm going to look at the markets, if there are bubbles, can there be bubbles? Well, one way to look at it is the equity market capitalization relative to our gross domestic product, the reality of GDP, the national economy, and the total capitalization of the stock market. And it got up to, you can see, that the uh, market cap is twice the stock market, 1.82 times. And that was in the bubble, 2000, the tech bubble. And it came down below in uh, 2009 to 8.84. Well, that's because stocks had a bubble in them. The, the intrinsic value of stocks, in, in, as measured by GDP, um, was vastly exceeded by the market value of stocks, people's expectations. So you can see hints of a bubble there. Now, I don't think you need to look at this over long periods of time, but you can see there are big jumps, and I don't think it has I think a time factor in it. Because there are a lot of factors that go into it. But you can see what it was doing in, the, in 1929, what it was doing even when the 40s began. You can see the 70, 72, 74 crash, 81 to 37. And the dimensions of these things are, are not too far off. There's a cut in half, and again, cut in half from 182 to 84. You know. So there, there is persistent um, overvaluation, and then it changes. Another good one, people don't look at these things very often, and, and this is really quite striking. This is uh, the value of this, the price of the Dow Jones average uh, relative to. Did we get that title right? No, we not the right title right. It's a, the market valuation. Yeah, it's a, this is the value, the market value of the Dow, uh, relative to the book value of the Dow. And uh, I'll fix that up in round two when I repeat this to you tomorrow morning <laughs> or something. And you can see it eight times. The market value is eight times the book value, where a norm looks to be two and a half to three times. And things change over time, I know that. But eight times does seem to any normal person to be a little over the top. 
and then it reverts to normal, which is where it is now. And both of those things suggest that the market is in the broad range and fairly valued then. It's a, a pipe is a pipe that we don't really need to worry about. But uh, that's, that's the way it seems to me. And you've all seen, this is something you've seen before, and I just want to show you something you've had. I've used this chart for a long, long time. And uh, it's the, the sources of stock market returns over the decade. And you can see investment return. This is a long-term return created by business. In effect, dividend yield being entered, earnings growth that follows. And you can see it's pretty steady. Uh, you know, 8%, 6%. Big 14 there. Yeah, thanks, Bill. I'll try and keep my eye on that. And then this last decade, of course, very poor, in part because it starts with such a terrible dividend yield. And uh, you, can, you can see how it all comes out of dividend yield earnings growth. And there's where the 9.3% you read about the market comes from. The speculative return is whether those PEs are rising, the valuations are rising or falling. And you can see really an odd pattern, a reversion of the mean here. I don't know how much to read into it, but it's the way things happen in the market. And that is speculative return was a big drag on returns in the 1910s, and had almost exactly the same amount in the 1920s. Big drag on return in the 40s, and on a slightly larger improvement in returns in the 50s. A big drag in the 70s, an exactly commensurate increase in the 80s, taking 7.5% off the investment return, and then adding 7.7%. And then for the first time in history, it repeats itself in the next decade. That in itself is a warning sign. Mm -hmm. So you can see where these returns come from, what you can count on. The, the whole point of this is it's all about fundamental returns, investment returns, only corporate America, and not only the markets. So we look at this, I've used the, this chart, I'm going to show you one new one. But you can see how closely in the long run the market return, total return in the market, tracks the investment return. Investment return clearly drives the market return, and uh, if you divide one to one, that little those little jiggles you know, amount to something much bigger. It's the same chart, just looked at a different way. And again, you can see the investment return go way high up in the tech boom, and then back to more or less a normal phase. And one would be the the exact. It starts at one, ends at 1.1, 1 .1, and it probably will end at 1.0 somewhere along the line. So you have a pretty good handle on long-term returns for a white corporate business. Now, one thing I had never plotted before, however, was the investment return, and this is the next chart, and just plotted the speculative return separately. And you can see the investment return grows, and grows at a rate of around 9% a year. The speculative return is up, and it's down, and it's zero. So it's all a business of capturing the returns earned by corporate America and not worrying about the valuations placed on those earnings by Wall Street. And it's quite a remarkable chart. If it goes nowhere, if one goes nowhere, this is what one would expect in 113 years uh, in terms of, of the addition and subtraction of speculative return, it's business return that drives it. And that's central to my own investment policies and theories. And, uh, so it's worth thinking about that, and I'll be using that chart a bit more just to try and get things across to academics and others. It's a little complicated for some of you, but I think the charts make it pretty clear. The basic proposition would hardly be more obvious. Rely on investment return, think about how corporate earnings are going to grow, corporate dividends, and forget all these fluctuations with these nut, with these nut cases, for want of a better word, on Wall Street, and looking at expectations drive up and down. If you want a big picture of that, just think of the last two weeks. Up 100 points, down 100 points. So what a veil. What does all that mean? People speculating about whether the government's going to close down. And they're not, when you think about it, you understand the market. They're not really speculating. And this is a very important point. They're not speculating on whether our government's going to close down. They're speculating about whether other investors will think our government's going to close down, right? <laughs> So they're guessing at what other people might do. This makes no sense. Uh, it's misleading, it's silly. And uh, so we're, we're trying with our theories about indexing and so on to drive the, the nut cakes and the fruit cakes out of the system <laughs> and get down to real investing. And it's a big issue. Uh, and uh, we just keep pounding away with greater and greater acceptance, I think. Now, I'm going to talk a little about competition. 
changing the subject from the Nobel Prize winners and the sources of market returns and to competition. And let's throw this first chart out from the largest fund managers. You can see that there's been a dramatic change in the last three or four years. It's all Vanguard's ideas about indexing and having a bond fund look at business um, and, and operating at minimal cost at the moment of roost. And here we are, $800 billion larger than Fidelity. They used to be probably $100 billion larger than we were. And uh, American funds having their own troubles. So they've just gotten too big uh, to be able to manage. When you get to a, a trillion dollars, you really can't be an active manager of funds. And I'm trying to have some correspondence with Morningstar about the, the American funds defense. They've calculated 8,000 10 year periods or something and said that they, they beat the market at 80% of them and, uh, or something. And the reality is, I mean, look at the data, but I can tell you what the reality is. And that is 98% of the 80% came before they got to be $1 trillion. <laughs> you know, you can do an awful lot when you're small and uh, sometimes right, sometimes wrong, I think. But there we are. And then there's the new ETF driven. BlackRock indexing business, and then PIMCO, of course, and this is their mutual funds. Uh, their their total book of business is around at three trillion dollars. They're somewhat larger than they overall, and uh, brings me to I can't remember if I said this last evening or not. But here we are over two trillion dollars. What's to be said? And an audience Q and A with an audience about uh, not a few months ago. Uh, people had people asked me. I have this question I have nothing to do with what I'm talking about, which I guess is some sort of a compliment. I don't know. Uh, said he, he, he must be very proud of reach the two trillion mark. And I said, look, what do you think two trillion dollars means to someone who's written a book called Enough? <laughs> and it's a, it's a delicate balancing act. Uh, you know, the director just, I, I was, I, I tried to find some kind of strategic consultants, Harvard Business School kind of thing, uh, many, many years ago. And the question I asked them was, what can we do to slow the company's growth rate? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why would anybody want to slow the company's growth rate? You could see the handwriting was on the wall all those years ago. We were just on the verge of getting the kind of big momentum that we see later on. And uh, yes, as the directors used to warn me, or used to call it, and I guess try and help me out through this dilemma, we're giving good employment opportunities in an ethical company with a missionary kind of zeal uh, to an awful lot of people, probably 35,000 or so now that come through our doors and some of them are gone, of course, in the nature of things. And yes, uh, we're giving probably 20 million investors uh, better returns than they otherwise might have had. And those are nice things. When you get to 14,000 crew members, it's just an awful lot. You lose a lot of person personality. I talk to all our work for excellence winners, usually about, I think about eight or 10 a quarter, uh, for an hour each, just kind of get a feel, kind of feeling of the kind of people we're hiring, which are terrific. Their view of the company, which is very positive, and uh, no matter how big it is, and uh, so it, it's all okay, but we still have a problem, which I, I define as uh, something I wrote years and years ago when I was running Vanguard. For God's sake, let's always keep Vanguard a place where judgment has a fighting chance to triumph over process. <laughs> and when you're running, when you're running a company with 28 people, there happened to be a dictator running it. <laughs> who didn't, didn't hesitate to decide this is what we're going to do and you know, just go do it. And if you need any help, I'd be glad to pitch in. And, uh, and that's a lot of judgment, very little process. I'm mean, going to get to 14,000 crew members now, 15, I suppose, 15,000. Uh, there's an awful lot of process and not nearly as much judgment. And you get more and more committees, more and more group think, more and more concern about uh, whether dissent is encouraged or discouraged. Uh, all those kind of things. And there's a simple reality here, and that is if you start with a line that has the percentage of the company that's 
judgment of the first sentence process, you start way down here, and when you get to 14,000, you're way out here, process dominates everything. And it has to. There's nothing anybody can do with it. There's nothing I can do about it. So I don't think it. But I think it's important to be aware of it, and to be aware that you know, no matter who's running that company, uh, you know, if you love bureaucracy, that line may be here, and uh, if you hate bureaucracy, maybe here, but it's never going to be back here. Just can't get there. So I worry about that. I mean, I believe in the human side of business, and I believe it's very difficult to do uh, without putting a huge effort and a huge amount of consciousness and awareness into you know, the importance of the individual always comes in. And uh, maybe, maybe just my idealism, shameless as always. But that's, I think, the big struggle that we really have in my opinion, the investment side locked in. The, in. the index fund is the gold ingot. It is the way of capturing your fair share of market returns. And yes, somebody else, I'll talk about this in a few minutes, somebody else may get more than that, that share of market returns, but then somebody else is going to lose. There's no systematic way to do it. So I think we're, we're operating with the right strategy. And I'm sure we are. So, still in the competition. You can see our cash flows are just enormous. Um, and uh, just keep growing and growing and growing. This year, it looks like we have a lot last year. Imagine bringing in $137 billion more. And the last year, it looks like about, last six years, it looks like about a trillion dollars, something huge, maybe eight years. Uh, and most of the long-term funds are not money market funds. So, business is booming. Uh, our market share, which we do, and you can do both ways, market share of long-term assets of funds, bonds, and stock funds, or, that feels good, um, and what we do with long-term assets, because uh, someone like Dimco, some like Capital Group, American Funds, don't have any money market funds, so uh, knock them way down, and Fidelity's a big money market fund. Fun thing and the numbers don't change a lot, but you can see how we've come from 1974 at 18 percent of industry assets, almost 18 percent, and just grows very steadily. You can see it actually goes a small, small print. You can see it month after month. There's a trend going on here, and I think it's going to be very, very difficult for anybody to break it. It's going to be very hard for a lot of people. You know, BlackRock has a terrible job because they have two. Two masters. That good too. Can you hear me okay in the back? Yeah. Um, they have two masters to serve, and uh, but the shareholders of BlackRock Corporation, and the shareholders of BlackRock and the ETS, and that that poses the issue with great clarity, because they can't say, yeah, we call, we charge more, but we're better managers because they're managing an index fund. They're going to do exactly the same, no better or worse than our index fund. So they are being driven, to, the marketplace is driving them to favor the shareholders of the ETFs and their funds rather than the shareholders of their management company. And Larry Fink is a very nice, very smart guy. Um, he's really stunned by this. He thought it was outrageous that anybody would ever run their funds at cost. And actually, a story that I haven't told to too many people, but back in 1974, the spring of 1974, when he was trying to get the Vanguard going, uh, I was at a capital group, had some friends from the ICI board, and I was out in California. I did a little tour of their office. They're all pretty small. And, and uh, John Lovelace, the president of it, who inherited his father, uh, I, I saw everybody but him. But he came in at the last meeting and said, I really have to talk to you before you leave Los Angeles. And I said, well, you know, I can't do it today, and I'm leaving tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock. So I'd be glad to meet you on a little bar stool in the diner <laughs> at 6.30 or 6 o'clock. He said, I'll be there. And uh, he said, listen and listen carefully. Don't start a mutual company. It will ruin this industry. And in a certain way, it has. <laughs> <laughs> it's been good for the consumer, and that's all. Well, that's and the investor, and that's what I care about. So, the um, when I say we're 
and now we got this tray. I think this is in the wrong place, uh, but we'll, we'll throw it in anyway. Um, this just shows the impact of ETS on the injection business. I'll talk about that as a separate subject in a few minutes. But uh, you can see that there's still, you know, since 2008, been a very nice growth in the assets of traditional index funds. I, had, I use the term so often in my in my book, Crash of the Cultures, that I had to think of an acronym. We always have to have an acronym. And so I call them TIFs, traditional index funds. I never thought I'd be reduced to that, but there we are. And they're two very different businesses, by and large. That a little bit later. But in any event, it's index funds, including index funds of all kinds, um, that are in the driver's seat. And you'll see they're like $600 billion almost since uh, the end of 2005, um, going into index funds, and $530 billion coming out of active funds. This is a trend. This is something that's not going to go away. This is part of our lives. And uh, so, we better get used to our growth, better be prepared for our growth. And you know, I may be wrong on this, there may be some bad thing happening. I used to tell people when they're struggling to get Vanguard going, that just when you think you've got it all made, some great big bruiser comes up behind you with a uh, pole axe and, and uh, smacks you right here in the, in the nape of the neck. <laughs> Bam! And, uh, so maybe that's going to happen to us. Who knows, really? But I don't think so. So let me turn now to some of what I'm doing now. We'll review what I am here. And uh, you tell me, Mel, if, I, if I'm just trying to go through this little, this little thing that I prepared for the meeting. You got what you need, Jeff. Hmm? You got whatever time you need. The elephant in the room. I've got whatever time I need. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to bore you to death, but I, I continue to be pretty busy, uh, if not very busy. I'm trying to be in honesty, in honesty, I'm getting a little old. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't, don't usually leave home until about 8 o'clock to come to work. It used to be 6, and I don't usually go home at 6.30 or 7 anymore. Uh, I usually go out try and get out by about 4, and uh, so I need to cut back on my schedule. I will say, just to be honest with you, it's amazing how I can't get it done during the week. So I, there are very few weekends that I'm not spending four or five hours doing some kind of reading or some kind of catch up or something like that. The other all the things you do just in the ordinary course of a non-business day, like read the Times, read the Wall Street Journal and so on. But in any event, some of the things you've seen are the bigger speeches I've given. Um, and uh, the lecture of Princeton, the financial system, a warning that change is coming. Uh, one of my favorites, uh, Big Money in Boston, a Boston security analyst which will be a chapter in the new book, uh, just because it hadn't been published before. And that's, you know, that'll, this will be published in the Journal of Portfolio Management uh, almost immediately. I guess we just sent those proofs back. A lot of work goes into this. And, uh, you know, we, oh, I haven't had this one typed up yet, but this is a, the Financial Education Association and a bunch of teachers, academics, and where they gave me the Scholar Educator Award one more little bowl. I what to do with all of them. Uh, and uh, down in, um, actually it was in, in South Hampton, Bermuda. And I didn't think I should be flying down there because flying is very difficult for me. But I told them I'd do it, so I did it. This was before my injury anyway. And I was in Bermuda for 24 hours. And uh, never spread <coughs> the air. That nice sea air down there. We used to go to Bermuda a lot. Day. So um, I'll have that, that will be published eventually. And then I was asked to give the um, keynote address at the 70th anniversary of CFA of Philadelphia. I think that's up on my site, Mike. I believe so. You believe so? I believe so. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't put it there. Just say yes, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that was a funny one because I, I think I told somebody this story last night about. About, uh, this was after the crash on my shoulder, and uh, my wife said, you're not going to go in there to give a public speech, are you? And I said, yes, I am. Why? Because I made the commitment. I'm repeating, I think, what I said to many of you last night. And she said, this is the apocryphal part of the story. She said, Paul. And she's right. She's always right. 
Um, she said, well, what happened if you were dead? And I said, well, you know, I think I'd probably give it anyway. <laughs> so, and then um, I just got yet another award from Paul the Magellan Group here, the Intrepid Leader Award. And then, um, oh yeah, here, here we are. And I, I also um, have a couple of financial analyst journal. I probably had, I think, eight or ten articles in the financial analyst journals. Uh, and this year, Big Money in Boston, as I mentioned, is going in. And it's really a pretty powerful speech, I think, and a pretty powerful essay. We, we added a lot for the final publication. And then I'm doing another one, which we'll soon see the light of day, which is the Financial Analyst Journal. And uh, Bill Sharp had written, Professor Nobel Laureate, Professor Sharp out at Stanford, had written an article called the, the Arithmetic of All in Investment Expenses. And uh, he talked about an expense ratio of one. 0.06% for the average large cap fund, 0.6% he picked the Vanguard stock market fund and said uh, the active management group will, just doing the math, uh, will um, give you, I think he said 80% of the return you would get in the index. And uh, these things have been driving me nuts for years when people act as if the expense ratio is the only cost worth talking about. And it turns out to be less than half, a lot less than half in fact of mutual fund costs. So I wrote an article which was supposed to be a rebuttal and it turned out to be, I don't know, maybe 25 or 30 pages. And uh, they agreed to print it and uh, to take a look at all the costs of investing. And the problem with the other costs of investing, portfolio turnover costs, cash drag, because most funds have a significant cash position, and marketing costs, sales loads, investment advisory, these paid to financial advisors are outside of anybody's ambit, and no one, no one, no one can calculate them with precision. The, for whatever it's worth, the, the expense ratios are precise figures, so they're easy to deal with. So when you eliminate, in my thesis is that you eliminate a consideration of anything that is a big drag, but imprecise, you better estimate it. So I went through there and I, and I got to a very conservative estimate of I think 2.26% 2, 2 for all income costs, which using Bill Sharp's mathematics gives you, uh, an active fund gives you not 80% of the market's return of the index fund's return, but about 60% of the index fund's return of the return of the investment. So uh, that's going to be an important article. I think a lot of people are going to think I was too high on my expense estimates, and I'm sure I'm not. And uh, a lot of people will think they're too low. And uh, so presumably both, both sides will speak out. But in any event, uh, it's, uh, it's fun to be in the still writing. And then, you know, doing things like interrupting my writing. And every day it seems like there's some darn thing I read in the paper that gets me so excited. I can't wait to deal with it when I get in the office. And there go all the other projects. So, um, you know, sometimes it's, noon before I start to get to, uh, you know, cleaning up yesterday's work kind of thing. So it's, it's crazy. Uh, I understand that. Uh, probably too old to do it. Uh, I think that's true. And when my mind isn't up to it, um, I guess I'll just stop. Um, I don't expect that to be very soon. But who knows? It's not in my hands anymore. We age. So um, a lot. I think we've accomplished a lot this year, and uh, thanks in many respects to Mike and Emily and to a lesser extent to Sarah. And uh, so they, they get us through the day. Now, um, I don't know how we got to projects here. Three, don't put that up yet, Mike. But uh, I want to talk about how fragile, I want to talk about the beginning of Vanguard, talk a little about the end of Vanguard, where we are today. This huge momentum, uh, unbelievable, and uh, how we began. And we began, to be honest, without a fighting chance. And uh, in, the, uh, in the written, in the speech I did in Boston, I had slides so I could do this. I couldn't do it in the, in the book where it's reprinted, the, the Man in the Arena book. But uh, I got two two slides coming up here about. Uh, how fragile and how the odds were so totally against 
a bad car even existing. And uh, you want to throw that. And when I was out in San Francisco, uh, I bought the New York Times out there, they published out there. And I thought, well, this looks pretty good. House of Fun Man to Come Back was the headline they greeted me when I got on the plane. Oh, that's nice. And then I get to my office, probably later in the day. It was later in the day. The next morning, there's the article in the New York Times published in New York. And look at that bloody question mark. <laughs> <laughs> Would he or was, does she or doesn't she, as I had <laughs> wave or something, used to say. And uh, it's just an evidence of the, of the uh, delicate balance act that it took to get Vanguard going. And uh, when we finally did get him, it was really close quotes, tears, not so much laughter, and determination. Disingenuity um, on my part, and uh, I just wanted to get it done. Uh, I don't think I'll ever understand exactly why, except I'm a competitive person, and I didn't like having the, my own company being taken away from me by people who would cause this failure. So um, that was fragile, and then we started finally did get business, as you know, on September 26th, I think, 24th. 24th of 1974, and uh, so we just had our 39th anniversary, which was not much recognized, well, a couple of the publications recognized it, a couple more still doing it, uh, 39th anniversary. And uh, at the beginning, just to give you an idea of what we were confronting, uh, I think this chart is called the fragility of Vanguard. You know, how about that? You know, we lost 108. <laughs> million dollars, that was a lot of money when you had a billion and a half, 1.4 billion in enterprise. Then we lost another 103 billion in liquidations. Then we lost 171 billion. And at the end of the next year, I was so excited. We had a $33 billion improvement in cash out. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you got to think when you're down in those depths, believe me. Uh, and. Uh, so, from that start, uh, with you know, trying to get so much done in such a short time, you know this story, but I'll just allude to it again. Uh, the first thing you got to do is realize that you're in a business you don't really want to be in, administering the funds. I mean, it has to be done right, but it's not gonna, you're not going to change the course of the world by being a good uh, <coughs> shareholder record keeper, or a good accountant, or a good compliance officer. You're going to change it by the kind of funds you have, by the way you decide to run them, by how you decide to distribute them, and how you decide to evaluate them. And uh, so we had to get to that. And this is, I think, fairly well known. I had to promise the directors in writing and a little memo of understanding that I would not get into investment management, and I would not get into distribution. And in two years, from the time we started, less than two years, uh, we had gotten into investment management distribution. <laughs> and uh, that's where the disingenuity came in. You know, I said, we're going to start an index fund. I want your approval of a new fund called an index fund. You're not allowed to get new investment management. And I said, well, we're, this fund is not managed. Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> and believe it, believe it or not, they bought it. <laughs> so that was the beginning, the index fund. Very important. Program. And the next was, uh, I want to take the funds no load, February 77. And uh, it seemed like obvious we were going to be the low-cost provider and expenses through our mutual structure. Might as well chuck the entire distribution system that's been supporting us for 50 years. And it seems like extreme, maybe. It didn't seem extreme to me. I didn't, I, think we, I didn't think it would be a problem for us. And we did it, and it was a problem for a couple of days. And then every, we just did it late in the think it was Wednesday night, we're meeting in New York. And on Thursday, we announced it to the press and uh, told all the broker dealers there would be no commissions as of Thursday. This is called going cold turkey, <laughs> which I, I don't know why I should use that expression because I don't get into that part of the world. <laughs> uh, so um, it was bold. Uh, you could argue it was uh, risky, uh, but it all worked and had to be done in a short period of time. And then we had you know, the municipal bond fund, multi-tier maturity, with a huge, huge difference in the bond industry. And uh, tax-managed funds, first of them, uh, and so on, and really it all 
it all came out in the end very well. See, uh, so we have. Um, I guess this is really more of a sort of sharp chart. Do you want to go to the next chart? Yeah, this, this is the, this is the basis. I should I got these charts a little bit out of order. This is the basis for that FHA article. Uh, it's, it's set to be published, I think. And uh, I didn't take all this into account, um, but you can see the reason. One reason it's all confusing is that uh, some of the costs are borne by the investor himself. Don't go through the fund books, sales loads. I throw in tax inefficiency. That's not total taxes. But the tax inefficiency, extra taxes paid by advisors, by advised funds, uh, actively managed funds, and then investor behavior, because funds are buying too late. So it becomes, that, that number becomes like well, almost uh, almost 4%. But I don't, I don't take those, those uh, tax inefficiencies and investor behavior into account in my overall matrix. I mentioned them in the books, so people get the idea. And there you can see the index enhancement after 40 years. It's a 65% increase in the value of your account. It seems unbelievable. That's just the way it is. And that data will be in there, although I don't extend it for, for those last three, three factors. Of it. So it's an analytical article. And I think it will be a significant article. Uh, but I, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I just hope it gets some attention, because people are thinking a lot about retirement today these days. Um, so that's part of the project that I should have mentioned earlier. Uh, another project, books. <laughs> what do we say here? Oh, um, when I don't have anything else to do, someone asked me to run a forward to their book. Um, so I've written uh, forwards to a book by uh, John Wasick called Kane's Way to Wealth. And uh, I, I've been very interested in Kane since my days at Princeton. It's been a very important part of my life, so I was happy to write that. And the, these people expect about 500 words, and I give about 5,000. Uh, but that seems to be okay. And uh, then we have um, a biography of Paul Cabot. And uh, actually, it's arguable that State Street, in fact, was the oldest mutual fund before MIT. Because it started operations earlier than MIT. That's Mass Investors Trust. It got incorporated later. So and the formal thing has been given to MIT, the oldest mutual fund, the first mutual fund. But it's a, it's a fascinating biography in which I show how the industry was much closer and when it began, much more fiduciary, much more pure than pure than boss, now use the expression. But it is today. And uh, this is also a theme of my big money in Boston speech. We went from being fiduciaries, prudent, puritanical, Boston trustee, being this great big marketing business. And I described Vanguard in this big marketing business as being basically as a book that came out a few years ago called Puritan Boston and Quaker Philadelphia. <laughs> and uh, when you think about it, which I did, is that uh, Vanguard is very much a Quaker firm. I don't have to be a Quaker. But uh, it's what's Quakerism about? It's about simplicity and it's about thrift. And uh, I think we live up to that, so we are bringing the, bringing the business back to work again, at least I think and hope. Now, like everything I do, there's probably a little overstatement here, a little hyperbole, but uh, I believe it and I don't really expect anybody else to do it if they want to, that's fine. Um, so now let's go to, oh my goodness, we have a lot of stuff here. We're not going to talk about media yet, right? Not yet. Okay. We're going to go to some issues that I see facing the industry and perhaps facing Vanguard, which I call emerging issues. That's not uh, pretty exact. Actually, Mr. Vogel, do you want to? I've got this quote from Adam Smith here. We've got the Adam Smith book forthcoming, the Princeton Review of Adam Smith. Oh, that comes from the. Um, that's Puritan, that's a Puritan? Yeah, I'm Smith book that Richard Hanley was doing. Okay, th this is a, uh, right. well, let me see where we are here. I hate this stuff. And then we'll do the next book, Man of the Arena. Yeah, but we're skipping it, man. If you want to, okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're great. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
um, let me just take a quick breath here. Show a little uh, bad stuff down your throat. <laughs> no, that's fine. Okay. I hope this kind of informal exposition that I'm giving you is okay. I think uh, I kind of enjoy the informality. I'm doing a lot of, by the way, when I talk about speeches, I've, given, I've probably given in the last year maybe half a dozen at least uh, speeches that I do Q&A and they require no preparation, and they're very informal. If you get a good moderator, uh, and a tough moderator, even like Don Phillips out of Morningstar, um, really tough, uh, you can have really a good session. So with a good moderator, I think the audience probably likes it better than formal speech. But the reason I still stick to a certain amount of formal speeches is I continue to believe the history of this business and the history of this company are important. And uh, so if you give a formal speech, you give it not really, because it's a speech, it's an important chapter in one's thinking, or one's life, or the life of one's company. And uh, so I do that for the discipline of it, for the historical <coughs> implications of it. I've gotten to be, and this apparently happens to a lot of people when they get antique, <laughs> a, real, a real interest in history. And the industry, the history of this industry is really shoddy. There's not very much written about it. You can find books here and books there. Um, and I've, I've tried to collect as many of them as I can, but there are probably six books, including like the Yacht book on Paul Cabot, that are pretty good insights into how the industry grows. Because I think if you don't know where you've come from, you're just going to be a loser. And uh, you know, you've got to understand where you come from. How to, if you've got something going for you when you begin, how do you maintain that at the end? And that's, of course, a huge issue. But in any event, um, I think this is at the end of uh, this is the end of big money in Boston, is it? Yes. Uh, and and this ties in with I when I did, was asked to do this Adam Smith book that I mentioned there. That's being done by Professor Marquette, being published by Oxford University. And I've written the final chapter called Adam Smith and Capitalism, and I really enjoyed it. I did a lot of research. I felt like I was back in Princeton. Uh, really, a lot of fun to do, and a lot of research. Now, the Wealth of Nations, no matter what anybody tells you, was not an easy read, but I read an awful lot of it over again after all those years. I never read it cover to cover. I don't think we had to do that. But the final quote in that book says something about Vanguard, says something about the word world, and says something about the enduring fundamental principle that comes from Adam Smith in 1776 is what drives Vanguard. And that's the part that's italicized at the bottom, you read the whole thing. The interest of the producer ought to be attended to only so far as it may be necessary. But promoting that of the consumer, the maxim is so perfectly self-evident, says Adam Smith, that it would be absurd to even attempt to prove it. The interest of the consumer must be the ultimate end of an object of all industry and commerce. And that's what we are doing, I think. That's what the mutual structure means. And that's why people are going to have to we're going to see this industry change, and they're going to have to either get, get along or get out. And in the long run, this industry is going to look very different than it does today. And I'm sure Ned Johnson's going to have his cash cows up there, and he's going to take poodles, hundreds of millions, or maybe more, out of the Fidelity funds and his other businesses. He has quite a few businesses up there, year after year. But they're going to have to dwindle. Uh, he's going to lose market share. It's just going to have to happen whether he likes it or not. There's very little he can do except enjoy the couple hundred million a year. And uh, I suppose that's easy to do. I haven't really thought about it too much. Don't need a yacht. <laughs> so, um, you know, that is an enduring principle. So when you think about it, it's the bottom line, uh, the fundamental principle that Vanguard is based on. So when I discovered that sentence in The Wealth of Nations, and I've probably seen it before, but I didn't make a big note of it, it not only fits into the the Adam Smith whole idea about uh, Puritan Boston and Quaker Philadelphia. Uh, but uh, fits into the whole context of how econ econ economies work, how consumerism works, and uh, that's what we are facing, and that's going to be very enduring. Now we'll go over to some of these emerging issues. Uh, and uh, first is target date funds.
Do you want to go up to um, 31? Ta da! Um, so here we are, and uh, I don't know why I didn't think about this before, but I, I have a concern, not, not really a serious concern, maybe it is, of the um, fact that target date funds seem to assume that all of your retirement assets are invested in securities. And up to that point, they make a certain amount of sense. I mean, nothing is perfect. They're probably better than the alternative for an awful lot of investors. But the, the reality is that uh, I work with memo this is some of the people at Vanguard. Uh, that when you ignore Social Security, you ignore something very, very important. And uh, I said I had no idea what percentage of retirement plan target date fund investors are on Social Security or have Social Security available or will have. And it turns out they know the answer to that. Steve Buck is a very, very good guy we have to hang I don't know if he's going to speak tonight. Is he going to be there tonight? Oh, no, he's not. Uh, he's a really good guy. He runs our retirement something unit, some kind of unit. And uh, he, he's very good. And he said 85%. 85, they know that 85% of our target date holders are, uh, of our, uh, have Social Security. So just look at what difference it makes. Uh, you know, I think an average investor at age, retiring at age 62, that would be kind of a low ball number, $300,000 value, capitalized value of your Social Security. And I took a top earning under Social Security investor, and retiring at 70, and man, is that check, I think, it, I think the check goes up 50% from the time you're 60 to the time you're 70. And you get, you get paid 10 years less. It's not necessarily a steal at all. Maybe a bad, bad judgment. The payments are doubled, roughly. Uh, in that period, and that's 575,000. So you think, well, if I've got 575,000 dollars and I put it into a target date fund outside of this, and not a lot of investors are sitting around with 575,000, and I put 100% in stocks, I'm 50% in stocks and 50% in fixed income. 575 in Social Security and uh, 575 in stocks. That probably is not excessive. And uh, I don't know if I have that next elusive chart. Yeah, they really, uh, well, I'll come to that in just one sec. So we really ought to rethink the way we present and the way we maybe warn investors or inform investors that they have to take Social Security into account. And I have to say I'm one who does not feel Social Security is endangered. Um, I, we had that legacy forum for me in New York. Uh, sitting up there with Paul Wilker and Kathleen Hayes, the interviewer, said something about, do you worry about Social Security kind of thing? And I said, well, you know, it's, it's a matter of political will, it's not a matter of economics. I said, Paul and I could fix it in 20 minutes, and uh, you just make us ours. And Paul looks at me and says, couldn't we fix anything? <laughs> and I think the answer to that is yes. Um, you know, so much politics surrounding common sense economics. But in any event, um, that's a big issue that we ought to be thinking about. And then I do wonder a little bit about uh, some of the change. We'll talk about this in terms of some of the new products so called Vanguard had. And that is uh, should international bond be 20% uh, of the 40% bond, is that 40% bond position? Right. No. It's about 45 45%. And uh, so 9% um, of the 45 is, is that a good idea or not? And I think we want to be a little careful in this world to stay as close to simplicity and avoid distraction as we can. You know, I don't know what they're not going to talk about this a little bit later. I don't know whether international bonds will, will be uh, better than the U.S. or not. How would anybody know that? But it seems to me that in the bond market in particular, you know, maybe they'll be one percent a year better than a lot of what we're trying to one value against another out there. And you have one percent more return on X percent of your money, and it just doesn't it gets long since lost in the shuffle. So is it worth doing a little extra projects, putting a lot of money in a new fund, uh, or is that that's a, that's an issue that we're talking about? An emerging issue perhaps. Uh, then on the same, basically on the same subject, uh, and that is once you retire, I was trying to explain this, so maybe Christine Betts, I think we talked about this this morning, 
we've got to stop focusing on the level of the stock market. Um, you know, it goes up and it goes down. Well, it's just to be said, it fluctuates. It's been fluctuating since the button would trade in 17, 85 or something, and it will continue to fluctuate. It's just a great big misleading indicator. And what's important is the income you get. So when you own that Social Security, you're going to get a check every month. I presume, I don't take any but yeah, I guess you get a check every month. And uh, mine is big, by the way. And, uh, <laughs> and you get an income check, let's say you have a monthly income check. But what matters to you is that those two checks amount to, let me say, $2,000 a month. Pick a number out of the air. It doesn't matter uh, whether the value of the, of the stock behind that income is going up or down. It's dividends that are important. And you can see here, uh, what a remarkable record. I mean, this is dividend on the s &P. It pretty much goes up without interruption, sometimes a little slower, sometimes a little faster. We, of course, had the crash in 29, 33. You can see a big drop there. And the only other significant drop in dividend income since 1929, 33, was in 2008-2009, or 2007-2008, when all the financial stocks eliminated their dividend. So the dividend drops have been pretty big, 20% or so, $28-$21. But look where it is now. It's back to $32, and the banks aren't doing much help to them. It's just normal dividend growth that we expect our corporations to produce because they make good products and services, and they're competitive all over the world. So it's dividend growth and the amount of the dividends uh, that we ought to be focusing on. And it's amazing to me how few people are paying a lot of attention to dividends and dividend yields and uh, how much dividends matter in the long run. Uh, this next chart, uh, I guess it's called Dividends Matter, uh, just shows you that invested in the stock market all those years ago at uh, a capital return of 572. We're supposed to fix that chart, Mike. That's right. When you reinvest the dividends, it's almost 10%. Say again? With, without dividends reinvested, it's 572. Yep. But if you reinvest dividends all, all along, it's almost 10% per year. Yeah, no, that's right. We were going to put in. Don't you remember this? Can't you remember anything? <laughs> 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 we're going to put the amount of dividend reinvestment. Okay. The, uh, 4, 420. We'll do that for tomorrow. <laughs> okay, tomorrow. <laughs> uh, I think if I get thumbs. And uh, <laughs> so you can see the difference between $132,000 and $4.23 million. Mm. Whether you reinvest dividend. That's a difference, isn't it? And uh, so we shouldn't forget dividends. And I think the reason the industry forgets them is that typical equity fund consumes about 50 or 60 percent of the yield in investment expenses. So at a 2 percent market, the average fund with a 1 percent expense ratio, it's actually higher than that, <coughs> is going to give you a 1 percent yield. They take 50 percent. The industry does generally not not a lot of variation until you get to Vanguard. It takes 50 percent or 60 percent even of your dividend yield. When the dividend yield, quite obviously, the difference between failure and success. If people would only focus on this, but you're not going to find your fund manager focusing on it. Now, if you ever convert it to real terms, that is to say, just for the value of the dollar, uh, the result is going to be really quite shocking uh, in, in, in the cost of mutual funds. In, and you can see in their income statement, you know, one percent uh, yield on a two point one percent market is or two percent market is one uh, percent yield is consuming one percent expenses consuming fifty percent of the yield. So you know, I'm just trying to wake up people to these obvious things that are happening, but they're you know, I think self-servingly eliminated in the way the industry does. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit now about. The bond index, I talked about this last year, I'm not going to say too much more, but I'm uncomfortable with the way the bond index is structured. It's 70% government, 76% government and government related bonds, and the remainder, you know, less than 30%, in corporates, where corporate bonds have a higher yield and therefore will do better in the long run than governments. They always have and they always will just because they have a higher yield. And, uh, they, they, attrition rate in corporates. Fault rate is so small it doesn't really dig much into that. This is a good grade for So um, uh, I think we should be trying to either get Barclays to put a new index together or think about the weaknesses of this existing uh, in the index. Because people
people need yield out there. People are dying for yield today. You, you all know that. And uh, so if you can get a little more yield by being in a corporate bond index fund as part of an overall bond index, or change the bond index, which is something that's not going to happen, you have to be very bold to do that. But say faint heart and airward, one fair lady or something like that. You know, sometimes in this life you've got to step up to the plane. And I would say this is one of them. And uh, so I'm looking for these people to get concerned about yields, easy ways to improve yields, at least I think they're easy. And uh, what number are we looking at? 35. Uh, yeah, so that's really, I just bring it up again, it's something that I'm keeping my eye on. Uh, next issue is a competitor called DFA. Uh, I mentioned that um, Gene Fama is a director and one of the, one of the inspiration for the founding of DFA. And he gets all this credit for indexing when he doesn't even like it. But they have an interesting firm. They're, they're good people. They charge an awful lot uh, for what they do. And they have proved unable to, to isolate segments of the market that are persistently undervalued. Now they try, uh, but it just doesn't happen. I think it's very counterintuitive to consider that in Canada. You can look back and see it, but as soon as you can see it backward, it's not going to happen forward. At least that's what they're doing. So um, they're doing very well. They're probably our biggest real competitor in terms of quality, in terms of cost. Uh, but still, because of their cost, I don't know if that had their cost ratio there. I'll give it to you in a sec. Um, but we still do better than DFA when you look at the Morning Star ratings. These are all on appendix to, uh, to clash the cultures of the data for the 50 largest funds are there. So um, they're a tough competitor. They charge, I think their reported expense ratio is 0.36, uh, which means that they're way above average in terms of returns. But behind Vanguard, I think, I think we are number two or three and they're number 12 or something. Uh, but their total costs they report to you don't include all their costs. I haven't quite figured all this out yet. I'm not sure anybody has. But investors have to pay 50 basis points to the advisor to get to the DFA. So instead of 36, it's 86, and that doesn't appear in the data. So we continue to you know, maybe give the competition a hard time. Uh, another emerging issue is so-called fundamental indexing. Very ballyhooed, Rob Arnott does that. I won't let anybody else use the term fundamental, although I use it all the time. Um, or yet sued me yet. Um, but um, he says he's discovered the way to weight stocks by their earnings, dividends, book values, number of employees, number of uses. And he has a secret. Well, you can see there isn't much of a secret there. Uh, that Rappi 1000 has had an average return of 7.3%. Just about a perfect fit with our mid cap ETF, because that's what it turns out he's selling. It's really an active managed index fund in Rappi's case. And, uh, he has a high correlation with it, probably about 99 of those two together. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and even, even if you look at it compared to total stock market, our total stock market ETF, he's done about 80 basis points a year better, which is fine, but only at the expense of uh, having uh, a risk level, standard deviation, volatility uh, of about 20% more. So he's taking more risk and he's getting more return. What else is new? So he's, he's kind of flogging that, and that more power to him, I guess. But I'd just be very careful of anybody who says they've discovered that something better than indexing, I guess I'd say. Um, next, uh, I want to talk a little bit about ETFs. And uh, this will, um, we keep getting painted into this box where Vanguard loves ETFs and I hate ETFs. Well, I guess you could call that thing. Uh, but it's not true. Uh, the Vanguard people who talk to periodically about all this basically agree with me. Uh, for someone that wants to buy and hold on an S&P 500 ETF, that's a very good investment. For someone that wants to trade into a triple leveraged nutcase ETF, uh, that's um, just crazy. And they're all ETFs, so it depends on the distinctions you make. And I think the difference between Vanguard and gold are actually way overdone. And, uh, and uh, our, you know, the press likes this kind of stuff. And uh, they say, I understand you hate ETS. I've had to develop a response to that. I spent a lifetime trying to avoid hating any inanimate object. 
<laughs> so you got you got to respond. They use it over and over again. So even you get tired of it. So um, it's uh, a huge part of the business. But look at how they turn over. You know, if they're all long-term investors, uh, how do we get 2,203 turnover for State Street? That's the Spider Group, and 5,000, 4,600 percent turnover. Aspire. This is not long-term investing, and uh, Vanguard does very well, 213% turnover ratio. But in our funds, that number is about 12% or 15%, so it's very high for many we're used to. It. There's a lot of gambling going on here. That's a line from, what's the movie? Casablanca. Casablanca. A lot of gambling going on around here. Um, and uh, see, I mean, those are just the facts. A direction sells these leverage funds. 10,592% turnover. And this is called long term investing. I mean, someone's pulling somebody's leg here. And uh, the reason is that uh, only about half of the, of the uh, shares of ETFs are held by individuals. Uh, more than half, mostly, are held by financial institutions that are trading. People are speculating, arbitraging, doing all those funny things. And you can see the numbers there. I guess those are the Vanguard ETFs. Seventy-two percent of the bond market seems a funny way to do that. People like to be in and out of the market. That's, that's what it's doing. And you can see that institutions are a big part of the ETF business, and they're traders. That's all. They're just traders. So um, then we look at you know, Vanguard did a survey of our retail accounts, and this is a kind of interesting thing. And you know, I think they probably wish I wasn't such a dog on statistics. But uh, this uh, table at the, at the uh, left up there is a table in you know, an exhaustive report Vanguard did to its own shareholders comparing holders of, say, total stock market index with holders of the ETF index. Very fair comparison. And they find out that uh, there's still much more of a long term bias uh, than there is trading, hands on trading or short term trading. And the problem I had with that study is. First, and I didn't realize this until last night, I was talking to a couple of our ETF people, and that is, they tried, in the article they wrote, they tried to generalize that ETF holders are long term by looking at Vanguard holders. And that's just a mis conceptual mistake. Everybody knows we're going to have more long term holders than anybody else. And, and uh, number two, it ignored the activities of institutional clients. And it turned out that. Uh, I'm not sure of this number, but it turned out that survey we took um, was a, included the five percent of our shareholders. So I don't know what you want to do about a survey that shows decent results uh, that only includes five percent of your shareholders in total, and maybe seven or eight percent, but it's not not more than that. And uh, so that gets into another way of looking at the chart. Uh, this is the way you want to look at it. You don't if you don't like the data. We have a 25% drop in the very same data in long-term holders, and 125%, 140% increase in short-term trading holders. So I'm not sure the chart is as good as what they say. Um, and so those are big changes that we want. And the ETF is a different business. It's a marketing business. You know, I'm not sure it's bad for us to be in it. It's certainly been a good marketing opportunity. And Probably is a better way of going to Vanguard for your ETFs. It's probably a better way of going to anybody else. But I still wonder about the underlying premise of ETFs. And, uh, you know, I kind of die hard. Uh, I have an idea and I don't give it up, uh, except pretty actively. Uh, let me just give you a few more. And I do like the informality. I'm afraid some of it is stretched together and uh, quite the way I want to do, want to do it. But uh, we do what we can do. And I feel a little bit this morning like I often warn when they bring in a lot of shareholders to see me. And they, every one of them has wonderful, wonderful uh, ideas and things to share. Uh, a lot of adulation, I confess, which is nice. Which is nice. <laughs> and uh, so I, but I always leave with a feeling when they leave. Uh, and I think they're saying when they leave my office, my God, there certainly is a lot less to hold over with meets the eye. <laughs> I, hope, I hope that's not an impression I'm leaving with you. But uh, I'm just being who I am. 
uh, telling it as straight as I dare, and uh, having a little fun kind of reviewing where we've been and where we are. Uh, our next slide is going to take us to Vanguard currently, and uh, Vanguard, people have asked a little bit about this, is still being driven by the basic, in not only basic ideas, but basic investments we started all those years ago. Uh, you use the phrase old friends and good friends, you start to use that phrase a lot when you get old with people that you know. And, uh, my friends in, uh, these, these days, such a mortality rate that I'm the only thing I can think of is saying, my God, they're now shooting at us. And uh, so they are, and they, and they haven't hit me yet, but who knows. So you can see that the, the funds that we've been involved in all along, the new funds, the index funds, drive us. Uh, the return of Wellington Fund, the recovery of Wellington Fund, I strongly encourage you to read that chapter about what it took to make Wellington Fund recover, uh, taking it back to its roots, and uh, I feel that's one of the great accomplishments of my career, and also one of the, one of the things I owe to my great mentor, Walter Morgan, and one doesn't want to forget one's debts, one's debts to those who bring them along in this world. But you can see that uh, the funds that we had back then, these are just the largest 10, uh, I guess every one of them was created except for one uh, before, um, back when I was running the company. And if you look at all the funds, it's 87% of the funds we have. So we're still on the same track in the way that I'll show in a minute. It's even a little bit different. I have to confess, I scratch my head a little bit about the new things that are going on. I don't, I don't think I understand global minimum volatility. Sounds pretty good, I guess. <laughs> but I don't even, honestly, I don't even know what it means. And, I, I, and it is, I don't think anything fundamentally wrong with the International Bond Index. But I think those assets, it's that big because we put it in our target date fund to leave it to wiser heads and to decide whether that's a good idea or not. But anything that goes out of the mainstream uh, is going to find vocal skeptical. And vocal skepticism is going to be right X percent of the time. It's going to be wrong X percent of the time. Uh, if I said I think the right is going to be a much larger number than the wrong percentage, <laughs> I wouldn't be true to myself if I didn't own up to that. But uh, you look at some of these things, and some of it makes sense. Uh, I don't know about managed payout funds. I've always been skeptical of them. Uh, market neutral, I just scratch my head and think, what's that all about? And there are 216 of them out there, and the industry is 216, and they're all going nowhere. Uh, and uh, you know, first by equity, but they may be going nowhere backward. <laughs> and, uh, growth equity is that Turner Fund, the technology fund we, we began and uh, right at the market high, and uh, it was actually approved the previous year, and I was on the board, and I said, yeah, you're not going to tell me that these probably said these Jaspers could do better than the market. Oh, absolutely. And you look at their past record. I said, of course, I looked at their past record. That's what makes me sure they won't be able to do it in the future. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that was a, uh, the only redeeming thing about growth equity is there was a technology fund that we didn't call a technology fund. And that's the small amount of redemption. It has the, like, the biggest gap between fund reported returns and fund and investor returns of just about any fund in the entire mutual fund industry. The time is atrocious. And I, don't, I don't know if that'll be around forever or not, I doubt it. So there's always a question about how long these new funds will last. But there's no question in my mind about how long the original funds will last. Uh, I haven't really followed this very closely. But uh, we're doing a bunch of mergers just announced recently. And uh, I don't really have any comment about that, except we should always be looking to see. You know, it's hard to, it's hard to admit when you've done something wrong. And uh, just to be honest about it, it may be harder for me to admit that I've done something wrong than most people. Or maybe even any, uh, any anybody. And one never likes that. And you can see growth equity, which I just talked about, is now going to go in the U.S. growth, uh, which in itself had a tragic kind of a record. I guess it's doing a little better now. And uh, the fact of the matter is, I I don't want to spend too much time on this, but, well, I'll actually, I'll come back to it in a minute. And there's the managed payout funds, which is a question of, I think, what's the point? Uh, are going to be a single portfolio. One thing that is going right, and I'm not sure, I have no idea, actually, whether this is an accident design, is correlation. 
when Vanguard started, I talked about what we want here is relative predictability of fund returns. That was the phrase I used in the old days. We didn't use R squared, we didn't use correlation. Uh, but we wanted funds that didn't get out of line with their, with, their, with their peers. And we wanted that because you didn't have to be very smart to be a realizing, to realize that if you were more interested in management than marketing, uh, that what you, funds that are very different than their competitors will do much better and then much worse. That's the reversion of the mean that I documented at some length in the Clash of the Cultures. But uh, you, know, you can say, what's the matter with that? And in a sense, it's just a way of life, and there's nothing the matter with it, except, and this is a big exception, that people pour their money into the fund after it does well and pull their money out when it does badly. They expect too much. They expect the past to be prologue. And if there's anything we know about this business, is the past is not prologue. And actually, I would argue we know something even more important than that. And as the past is kind of anti-prologue. If you've done well in the past, you'll revert to the mean in the future. A very important part of my whole thinking about the markets. But what's happening, and to my surprise, all the index funds, as you can see, uh, have basically 100% correlation with their index, not very surprising, or 99. And funds look very much like the index, or are the index. You know, are up in the 90s. Uh, but what I'm, what I'm looking at here is what is the direction of change for these funds? And this is what I don't know whether it's accident or design, but our funds have gotten much more correlated, much more relative predictability, relative to the predictability relative to their peers uh, in recent years than earlier. They were very high earlier. And if you look at the 10 year correlations, that's everything in the last 10 years, obviously. And then compare that with the three-year correlations. And these very, very high correlations, 97, 95, 93, have all gone up because of those arrows. And uh, Wellington Fund may not be an index, a balanced index fund, but its correlation is now 98 with the market. I mean, that's too close to observe the difference. And I like that. And that was the whole reason, although I don't think present management likes it to be expressed this way. That's the reason I like money manager funds, multi-manager funds. And that is not that we can pick good managers. How can anybody do that? And I couldn't, and I may have set a low, a low bar, a low bar of entry, but uh, you, know, you make mistakes, and no matter how disciplined you are, no matter how much history you know, no matter how skeptical you are about the past, you make mistakes. And the odds are 50-50 if you pick a manager well, just for the fun of it here. And the odds are uh, one in four that you can pick two managers, one in eight you can pick three, uh, one in 16 that you can pick four, one in 32 you can pick five, one in 64 you can pick six, and one in 128 you can pick seven. And I think we have one fund with seven managers, maybe wins or two or something. Uh, so you know that you're going to get an average return compared to your peer group. It's like the large, the large numbers. If your peer group is, let's say, seven funds, and you pick seven representative funds to compare yourself with, those seven, or to, to, to run your money for you, those seven funds are going to almost inevitably have the same return as the average, on average, as the average seven is, as the total seven. So you like that because you win on cost. If we can just be average, the more managers, the more average you are, and you, you win on cost, you win maybe 50 or 60 basis points on expense ratio, uh, you win probably 30 or 40 basis points on negotiating fees with the manager, low expense ratio of the economy is the scale of the administrative side. 30 or 40 basis points on, on uh, negotiating with managers, uh, maybe hiring long-term managers instead of short-term managers, say 50 basis points on lower turnover costs, and finally you're selling at no load compared to other people who are mostly selling at load sales load of 1% a year or something like that. And you should win by 1.5% a year at least over a decade. If you do that, your returns beat the competition by 20%. And that's basically what the data show us. But that is not, as is sometimes alleged, that we are smart manager pickers. It's because the difference is cost. And we are average manager pickers. And really, you know, it seems so awful in this world to say we're picking average managers, or I would even say we want to pick the average managers and win on cost, but it's, it's the sure way and not the speculative way. 
So in any event, it's moving in that direction. I'm happy with that, uh, but I, I, I don't think it's, it, it, it may be delivered, it may not be delivered, try and be more competitors. And I should say this, going back to Mr. Lovelace, John Lovelace, he has this theory, which is not so different from ours. He had a very small number of funds, but they just keep adding portfolio counselors, he calls them. That's what I call investment advisors. <laughs> and uh, so he has somebody running 10% of the portfolio. I think a couple of their portfolios, in fact, have seven or eight. Maybe one of them has even 11 portfolio counselors. He said there's no such thing as too big. We just hire another portfolio counselor. Without realizing, when you go from one to 11, you're that much closer to being average overall but they don't bring the low cost into the situation. And in fact, mysteriously, uh, at the huge size they are now, their portfolio turnover is twice what it was a decade ago. It's much, much, much smaller. So that cost, the cost of executing tr transactions in a huge portfolio are obviously much more, much higher than the other ones. So in any event, uh, I call these funds virtual index funds, and uh, that gets the people that are running them the muni funds, I think somewhat bothered, but I'll stick with that. Um, and let's skip that next slide and go to the final section of this. I don't want to take too much time on this. This is the man in the arena of the new book. And uh, it's edited by New Rostad, uh, this fiduciary duty kind of self appointed guy. He's very active. Uh, he helped to create this legacy day in Wall Street, which is what this thing is based on. Probably have seen this. The next slide, um, I was held in Wall Street in January 2012, and we decided to do a transcript of that. And as great people like us, Sawyer, David Swenson, have some violent disagreements, by the way, in the middle. It's kind of fun to read. And uh, the uh, disagreements about whether you should, well, I'll, I'll just express it directly. Uh, Gus has a formula of some kind uh, that says, how much you should have in index funds and how much you should have in actively managed funds, depending on A, B, or C. And David Swenson, I just heard from the other day, he's really a great guy. And so is Gus, by the way, I don't need to make any comparisons, but really the top of their games, two of the best, with all of it, all of it me. Uh, and uh, he uh, says, no, nope, all or nothing. Index or don't index, there's no, there's no in between. And uh, so that's a, a nice little part of this. But then again, this, this new book began with those, those, um, the uh, transcripts of those things, including a transcript of the interview with me and Paul Volcker, which I must say is, I've never done an interview with Paul Volcker, and probably most of you won't. <laughs> you can't imagine what fun it is. I mean, the guy is so fun, and uh, <laughs> he makes me look like sort of a penny ante. <laughs> I had to tone my game up a little bit. And uh, it, it begins, it, it, it got a, it, I'm not sure exactly how this happened, but Knut Rostad wanted to put a lot of things that I've done in the book. And uh, I don't know if we have the, can we do the table? Oh, yeah, I'll show you the table of contents in a minute. And it brings with this, this great, um, great quote from one of many, many, many great quotes from Paul Sanderson. You know, I just got to tell you personally, um, the idea that this giant uh, has spent one minute with this poor little penny ante numbers counter <laughs> with his abacus out. Um, it's quite remarkable. But he has said such generous things about me and about the fun that we, of course, begin with that, get the audio to the reader all in the right play. I'll just go very, very quickly through the, the, uh, the contents. Andy Golden, the Princeton, who I'll be seeing tonight, Princeton, President Printo wrote it just a lovely forward. I didn't even see it while I saw the proofs. Um, and then uh, there's the legacy forum. It's chapter one, chapter two is Paul Roker. Uh, and then, then we've done some sort of sections around the Vanguard vision, part of character counts, part of the time to dance is my first billion dollar speech out of the crew. And uh, other things I've written over time, including primarily, to, I think one of my better works, more historically oriented, is big money in Boston. It's also going in the JPN Journal of Portfolio Management. And, uh, but it had never been in a book before. And I like kind of the idea of having these things, uh, things that I've done. I hope they're worthwhile. I don't know, but they're protected for a long time so they been within the covers of the book. Now, part three is the index fund vision. 
and that Joe Mendes White out uh, about the Morning Star uh, wrote the introduction. Although Joe told me actually John Reckenthaler wrote it, uh, which was great. And I was going to mention at the beginning, you know, I had kind of this spate, for want of a better word, of publicity in the last three or four months. I never know quite where it comes from. It seems like an awful lot. Including, give me a B, give me an O, give me a G. <laughs> <laughs> give me an L, give me an E, we might just keep all with me. Uh, and uh, and uh, also that, that paragraph, I should have mentioned this, not that paragraph in Taylor's letter about what investing is all about in my speech to the money fund. You know, it turned up, and this is such a funny thing to take pride in, but it appeared in a long article about uh, successful investing in, in the mutual fund edition of the Wall Street Journal. And they got all the way to the last paragraph of this long article at the very bottom. And there's this quote that I gave in 1998. And uh, I couldn't believe it. I took it as, as a huge honor to think that something I'd written 15 years ago, somebody, God knows where, found it. I don't know how people dig this stuff up. But uh, that was very rewarding to me. And John Reckenthaler's uh, later tribute, uh, nothing to do with the interview with the introduction here about saying my legacy was cemented before the last five years and it's been cemented even more in the last five years. And the reason I like that, I and mean, they're all very idiosyncratic, everything depends on the source who's saying it. You know, you can take great compliments as nothing if they come from somebody who doesn't kind of basically matter. Uh, but John is a skeptic, he's cynical, he's analytical, he has a sense of history, and uh, so to have him give me this huge accolade in his review of the last five years was really um, deeply touching to me. Uh, then we have chapter nine is the, is the uh, oh, that's the Gary Brinson speech I gave, a pretty, pretty comprehensive speech uh, that I gave at Pullman, Washington, uh, to Washington State University, I guess. And then we included the entire BOGO issue of the Journal of Indexing. Nice to have an issue, I guess. Uh, corporate Governance, big part of the book, two chapters. Uh, and Nell Minow wrote the book. She's the corporate government activist from, from the Washington, D.C. She it, it worked, it worked with Bob Bunks for a long time. She's a terrific person, a pretty good writer, too. And then The Vision of Service to Society is part five, Fiduciary Duty. That speech is out there, No Man Can Serve Two Masters. And then uh, I had a little bit about philanthropy written in my book, Enough. Uh, but I, I, I built that up a little bit at the editor's request with some new material on my own giving philosophy. And uh, so then we get all the way to the end, and we get sort of rewards for the vision. And Alan Roth uh, wrote an article about the Bogle Heads. Uh, that's where Taylor's comment came from, comments from the Bogle Heads, that I mentioned earlier. And then we have letters from clients and letters from the bank of crew members. and. Uh, then we have to go to the last, oh, next to last slide. We have uh, two people who are actually at the, the Legacy Forum. Uh, we're here today, uh, Alan Roth and, and Rick Ferry, both big boosters. And here are some of the other uh, contributions in the book uh, that are listed there from, from the Vogelheads. So the Vogelheads are an important part of the book, quite naturally. And finally, uh, Jeremy Duffield, my former associate, one of the great people in my business life, I wrote the introduction to my communication ability, and then we have reprinted the, I guess I have to say, honestly, star-studded list of people who have written forwards to my books over the years. And uh, starting to run out of forward writers here, guys. Wow. <laughs> but in any event, that's the way the book ends. And uh, that is the way my remarks this morning end. And now we'll go to the Q&A. Thank you all.